This week, my guest is Joe Truini, who's our simple solutions guru here at today's homeowner radio and television. And what Joe and I have been doing over the last few months is putting together the top five simple solutions for different areas of the home. This week on this Ask Danny podcast, it's time to talk about workshop tool simple solutions. And Joe, I'll tell you, it was, uh, I remember when you first told me about the one about nail polish. And I <laughs> went, oh, got a little this nervous. is going to be good. We're going to get a lot of attention <laughs> on this. And we're going to we're going to hear a lot about nail polish in the shop. Tell us all about it because it definitely works very, very well. Yeah, I remember you got a little nervous when I told you I had a simple solution with nail polish. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and this turned out to be, Danny, one of the most popular ones of the last year. So I thought I'd include it include it in our top five simple solutions for workshop tools. And this one is um, using nail polish in the workshop because many tools come with markings that are virtually impossible to read, right? Mm -hmm. Like wire strippers have the little gauge numbers and squares, of course, have numbers and little graduation lines that are hard to read. And in the example in the video, in the simple solution video, I used a socket. Sockets have stamped um, dimensions on it, you know, whether it's a three quarter inch socket or an eight mm -hmm. millimeter socket, whatever they're, it's stamped into the steel, but sometimes those stampings don't go in deep enough that you can see them. Um, and of course, if you're working in a dimly lit room, which we almost always are, they're just impossible to see. So here's how to make those numbers and those graduation lines much more, um, legible. Take some white nail polish, shake it up really well. That's important. Got to shake it for a good minute or whatever until it's really mixed well. Then just brush it on the the graduation lines or the or the stamped dimension line on the socket, whatever it is you want to see. Just brush it on, and you can slop it on a little thickly. It doesn't much matter. You just leave it on for just a second or two. You don't want it to dry, but you want it to settle into those depressions. And then take a cloth and just wipe it off. What happens, of course, is nail polish will settle into those depressions, and then it'll just pop. The, the graduation lines, the inch markings will just pop and make it much, much easier to see. So that's how you can use white nail polish in the workshop. And when you start looking around on a number of your tools, you realize there's a lot of those little etched little gravings here and there. And, you know, they get a little dirty, maybe a little grease on them here and there makes it even harder. This really does work out very well. And I would remind you that any of the uh, simple solutions that we're talking about, you can see video versions of these simple yep. solution segments by going to today's home homeowner.com slash simple solutions. You know, there's a lot of uh, tools out there too that um, a lot of people aren't aware. And 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 one of the tools that you're going to talk about in this next one will really help uh, prevent a very frustrating situation yeah. of installing screws and making wood splits. Because, you know, you use a lot of cordless tools these days and they're great. They speed up That's the right. process yep. and make it a little easier but it makes it more prone to splitting. Joe, how can you avoid this problem? Well, the secret is to drill a hole first. A lot of people don't. They just drive in the screw, and as you said, it'll split the board, especially if we're talking about three-quarter inch thick boards or even thicker boards. I've seen it split up two by four, which is inch and a half thick. Um, and if you're drilling near the edge of a board or near the end of a board, splitting is, is much more likely to happen. So here's how to avoid that. What you want to do is drill a screw shank clearance hole through the top board, and sometimes you even need to drill a pilot hole, which is slightly smaller, through into the bottom hole for the screw, for the bottom board for the screw to go into. Um, and the easiest way to do that is with a drill driver bit. That's just a generic term, different manufacturers. I think DeWalt has when they call it a flip drive, and there are a couple of different names. But it's essentially um, a, a drill bit that has two ends on it. It's got a, a Phillips screw driving tip on one end, and it has a drill bit on the other end. And the drill bit has several functions. It can drill the pilot hole, the screw shank clearance hole, countersink, or counter bore. And for those who aren't familiar, the difference, the only difference between a countersink and a counter bore is the countersink, the, the screw head will be flush with the surface of the top board. With the counter bore, it's recessed a little bit, you know, usually like about a quarter of an inch. In any case, drilling those holes first will prevent that board from splitting. Because if you just drive that screw through, it, I can almost guarantee it's going to split that top board, and you want to avoid that at all costs. There you go there, because it um, requires you a little more work in puttying, or, and of course, if you're staining things, that makes it really hard to end up with those professional results you're looking at. So we're going over these uh, top five simple solutions for workshop tools, and next up, trying to control 
progress because sawdust always right. is progress. So, <laughs> Joe, right. what about when you're using that miter saw? Because if it's blowing back in your face or you're trying to control some of the dust and so forth, right. boy, we need a simple solution for this one. Yeah, if you're using a saw and you're not making sawdust, then there's something wrong. So, uh, we're done. And it's amazing, even with thin kerf blades, almost all saws um, have thin kerf blades, meaning they remove very little wood. They used to, all blades used to be about an eighth inch thick. Now they're much less than that. And uh, so they're removing very little wood, but it's still surprising how much sawdust they put out, especially a power miter saw. And so, of course, they almost all have a uh, an ability to hook up a vacuum to it, but getting the vacuum hose to fit really tightly in the back of the saw can sometimes be a challenge. So this simple solution um, solves that problem with a section of rubber inner tube from a bicycle. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you take a short section of inner tube, maybe cut it four or five inches long, whatever, and you stretch it over the end of the vacuum hose. And then you take the other end, of course, and you stretch it over and you put it on the back of the saw on what they call the saw door, sawdust port, which mm -hmm. is usually a rigid plastic pipe that's sticking out the back of the saw. And what happens is that rubber of the of the inner tube will really grip both of those, the ends of the, end of the hose and the end of the port, grip it really tightly, and it's flexible enough that sometimes if the saw moves because you're swinging it right or left to make a miter cut, sometimes that connection can come off. With this, it will not. So that's how to collect your sawdust using an inner tube to connect the hose to the saw itself. Boy, that's great. You think about those, you know, when you have an inner tube like that, you... You hate to almost, you know, someone like you and I just hate to throw it away because you know <laughs> exactly. something like this can come along. So that's another great, simple solution on that. Of course, um, you know, when you see a professional out on the job site and he's grabbing that circular saw and he's just cutting so many cuts and, you know, right. no matter what they are, they just make it look so easy. But if you're not, you know, using a, a circular saw all the time, probably need a little simple solution on how to make those uh, straight, accurate cuts. What do you have for that, Joe? Okay, this is really handy for not only making straight, accurate cuts, but if you're making a lot of repetitive cuts and you're you're constantly making cross cuts with a circular saw, you want everyone, every end to be square. And by the way, when I get a board, whether it's a one by or a two by right from the, the lumber yard, I always cross cut the ends, the very end, just to make them square. Because if you look closely, they're not always cut uh, square. That's right. And if you're depending on it to be square, you know, sometimes you can run into trouble. So uh -huh. in any case, this is how to make a cross cut guide, which is basically just a T-shaped fixture, a jig, a T-shaped jig that you can guide your saw against. So what you can do is you're going to have, um, uh, take a one by four and cut it you know, maybe 18 inches long or so. Then you want to get a piece of half inch plywood and cut it about three or four inches wide by 16 inches long. And what you do is screw them together to form this T-shaped um, jig using a square to set it at exactly 90 degrees. That's important because, of course, if the, those two pieces aren't 90 degrees, your cut's not going to be 90 degrees. And then what you can do is make a make an initial cut Guide your saw along the fence, along the one by four fence, and trim off that piece of plywood. And what you're doing is your that end of the plywood shows you exactly where the blade cuts. So now when you go to make a cut, you mark the board. You don't have to draw a line all the way across the board. You just make a little mark where you want to make the cut. Hold the jig in place so that that edge of the plywood is right on your right on your pencil mark. And you just slide the saw against the the one by four, and it cuts right on the mark each and every time. Well, it definitely um, would help you kind of speed up the process if speed's of Certainly. interest to you when you have those repetitive cuts and and just makes it a little bit safer. Speaking of safer, boy, you can right. really get in a jam when you're trying to cut, you know, awkward pieces of plywood. You know, you might have it kind of halfway on a sawhorse or right. a little bit on your table saw, but let's make that a little bit easier for everyone with this simple solution, Joe. All right. The way most people cut um, a piece of plywood, a sheet of plywood, is they set it on a couple of sawhorses or even sometimes right on the ground or not on the ground, but maybe on the driveway or garage floor. And they put two two by fours under it and they make a rip cut, which is a long cut along the length of the of the plywood. But what happens is because there's just it's resting on just two two by fours. The, the plywood will sag, tend to sag as you're making the cut, and that'll pinch the saw blade. And that can, first of all, it can slow down the cutting and stop it, but it can also cause a kickback. And, and that's a pretty dangerous situation. So you want to avoid that by using not two two by fours, but four two by fours. So you want to put two in the center, right close to the cut line, wherever you're making a cut line, maybe just two or three inches on either side of the cut line. Then you make your cut. And what happens is 
Each half of the plywood is supported by two two by fours, not a single two by four. And because of that, there's no possibility of a sagging. And when you finish that cut, both pieces will be sitting right there on the saw horses and they won't be sagging or sliding around. Boy, that makes a big difference. I've been kind of in a jam myself a little bit when that larger piece of plywood starting to fall off and you're trying right. to grab things, just extremely dangerous. So it's always good, you know, when you have a simple solution that makes it simple, makes it more accurate, and, oh, by the way, it makes it a lot safer. Joe, I always enjoy going over all of these simple solutions with you, and we know we our listeners like it. And if you'd like oh, to comment on this or anything that you've heard on Today's Homeowner, we would encourage you to go to todayshomeowner.com slash ask, or you can go to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And I also want to mention, if you have a tip that's, that's right. worked well for you, whether it's a workshop tool or painting or whatever, you know, um, send it in because a lot of these simple solutions have actually come in from listeners to the podcast and the radio show or on TV, viewers of the TV show. So um, whether you whether you think we've done it, this simple solution or not, it doesn't matter. Send it in and and we'll. Take a look at it. Maybe we'll shoot a video of it, and it'll appear on TV and in the podcast. We always appreciate all of that input that we get from you guys, and we appreciate you listening to this podcast. We'll talk soon.